Naomi, welcome to Dad Saves America. Thank you for having me. You said you were coming to town. <laughs> I had just watched you on Stossel's show. It was like, oh, this is going to be great. We can talk about privacy. We can talk about Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so interesting that you focused on privacy with your channel because it's hard to know if privacy is even possible anymore. So I guess that's my first question. Like, is privacy possible? Privacy is absolutely possible. And I think one of the biggest ways that we've been hoodwinked is by people telling us that it's not possible and we shouldn't even try. And I think that it just allows such an incredible, massive amount of data collection from us because people just give up. They feel disempowered. They feel like there's nothing they can do. So they stop trying. And they fail to realize that most of the data collection that is able to happen happens of their own volition from things that they're voluntarily handing over because they're not reading privacy policies because they're not choosing services that respect their customers. They're just signing away their rights and thinking these are the only options, but they're not our only options. Uh, we can definitely make a huge impact on our privacy. And I think that we absolutely should be fighting for that because I think that privacy is fundamental for a free society. Why? Why is it fundamental? Because you can't push back against authoritarianism if you can't have a private means of communication. If the government does something that you don't like and they're surveying everything you do, how do you have freedom of association to rally and protest? How do you, you know, make financial choices to support causes that you believe in if everything is being spied on and censored? We don't realize that when you get to this Orwellian state of pervasive surveillance, which we are kind of at at the moment, we're in a really dangerous slippery slope and people think well you know i trust the american government or i trust the australian government or i trust the swiss government or whatever it is like whichever government that's great i'm really happy for you let's push that aside for a moment let's talk about the principle of privacy we can all agree that privacy itself is important even if you don't feel like you need it in your life privacy is important for a free society and you can see that in places you know like china if people do something that steps out of line you know they get in a lot of trouble but sometimes they have to live outside the lines to survive and so there are definitely places all over the world where if you are a dissident if you are a human rights worker if you're a lawyer an activist a whistleblower any Anything, privacy is is important so we can understand that the principle of privacy uh, is fundamentally important but now let's take back all these nice happy countries that we all trust and let's just presume well, let's we all <laughs> yeah well no I'm happy Some, to tell someone trusts them yeah I'm happy to just <laughs> give them that one I'm happy to say listen sure. if you trust them great, great but <laughs> regimes come and go social norms change but your data is forever. You have no control over who may get access to that data or how it may be used in the future. It could be used by some, you know, dictator who decides he wants to, you know, persecute a certain area of the sector of the population he doesn't like. It could be used by some hostile nation state that wants to attack your country. It could be used by some hacker group that, you know, doesn't like you for some reason. Like you have zero control over that. And the amount of data that you're creating and telling a story about your life is so personal and sensitive and people don't realize to what ends that could be used that they could be targeted to think a certain way that they're absolutely being targeted currently with all kinds of propaganda from nation states all over the world this stuff is going on and people just are unaware um, and i think that we kind of need to wake up so you are an immigrant to america i am <gasps> Da, da, da. and uh how does being australian impact the way you think about um, American sort of privacy rights. I love American privacy rights because it's one of the few places in the world where we kind of have it enshrined in the Constitution of the Bill of Rights. We have the Fourth Amendment that says we are going to curtail the amount that the government is allowed to see into your life. We are going to curtail, you know, unreasonable searches through your private belongings. Australia doesn't have that, so they were quite happy to do away with privacy a long time ago and say, you know what, we're just going to surveil everything you do on the internet and we're going to get rid of cash and we're going to make end-to-end -end encryption illegal. And so they're doing all kinds of crazy things. So I'm very happy to be in America where there are people still fighting for what I think makes this country great, which is a fundamental base that supports a free society. And I think we need to really, really work hard to preserve that fundamental base. And part of that are things like the Fourth Amendment. I feel like in the digital age with things like the third party doctrine, 
What is As that? A, What's the third party doctrine? So there are basically a legal precedents that have been set up through court cases in the United States that say if you give your data to a third party, you no longer have any reasonable expectation of privacy. Because in the Fourth Amendment, it says that, well, we're going to define these searches as uh, you, you can have, it, it, there's not going to be an unreasonable search through your belongings. So you've had all these court cases to say, like, what does unreasonable mean? And so through different court cases and precedents, it's been set up, but especially through a bunch of court cases in the 70s, it's been set up to say, well, if you give your data to a third party, you no longer have any reasonable expectation of privacy with that data. And in the 70s, okay, I, maybe you could apply that, but we live in 2024 currently, where basically our whole life has migrated to the internet and you cannot use the internet without a third party. Everything you do is third parties, right. every server, every, every connection. And so what the government is essentially arguing there is you have no reasonable expectation of privacy in a digital world, which I think completely goes against the constitution. It, it completely goes against uh, the the hope of maintaining a free society because we fundamentally need privacy uh, in our lives. Those cases, that idea of um, you giving up your privacy when you transact or give information to a third party at the time, do you know if that re related to banks and schools and things where you have to fill out an application that has personal information or in the case of your bank, they have your financial information or your, your, your investment banker or whatever, your 401k plan. Were those still protected in those court cases or was it already like, well, if you do anything other than leave anything outside your home, you're no longer private. Help me understand the pre-digital mm -hmm encroachment on privacy rights. So it kind of started with phone records, this idea, and it wasn't even the contents of records, it was the metadata around them, is was this idea that, you know, if you're telling the phone company which numbers you're dialing, they need to know that in order to facilitate the call so you no longer have a reasonable expectation of privacy with that. And that's how it was kind of first applied. And then from there, it just, we, we just kind of, it, it hasn't really been tested in the digital age. And we haven't pushed it to the limit where we say like, do we have a fourth amendment in the digital age? Because everything is third parties, but financial privacy is its whole other thing. So oh, we could talk about that, you know, starting with the Bank Secrecy Act, I think was a big turning point for financial privacy. So 1970, the government basically said, okay, we're gonna introduce two things to overhaul the financial system. We're going to, first of all, implement uh, a rule that says banks need to collect data. And, you know, we're not necessarily going to get that data, but banks need to start keeping records. And then the second thing is if there are any transactions over $10,000, they need to be reported. And at the time, there was an uproar. People were like, this is against the Constitution. This is unreasonable. Anyway, it went to the Supreme Court and essentially the Supreme Court said, well, $10,000 is such a life-changing amount of money and it's such a rare occurrence that someone would spend that obscene amount of money in 1970 that it doesn't seem so unreasonable. But the insidious part of the Bank Secrecy Act was they never wrote in any adjustment for inflation. Right. So it's 2024 and back then, you know, $10,000 could literally buy you a house in some areas, right? It could buy you two brand new Corvettes plus extra parts plus, you know, maintenance down the road. So what the courts were saying was this unreasonable, you know, amount of money back then has just been dwindling over years. And so built into the Bank Secrecy Act is ever increasing surveillance as the purchasing power of the US dollar goes down. And that's not the worst of it, because then you have all of these additional bills that were passed that further just eliminate our financial privacy and we're now in a state where where people think well you know I like privacy but I mean of course it doesn't apply to financial transactions we've normalized pervasive surveillance with finance and think well they need all that data but they got along fine without it for a really long time and it's been getting more and more invasive to the point where now the government wants to track payments of $600 if you use any sort of payment transmitter like PayPal, Venmo, like $600 threshold it is insanity. But there's so much in, in financial surveillance, it gets worse and worse and it's a really scary mechanism for control. So what what is the argument that is made by government advocates and government and like what's the case they're trying to make because it's not 
I don't think they're generally making the full blown mustache twirling like nah. I'm just gonna be ready in case I want to go full Stalin and mm-hmm. show me the man, I'll show you the crime. So I need as many potential crimes as possible. Mm-hmm. What was the argument being made then and, and what's being made now? The Bank Secrecy Act specifically. Uh, It was the idea that people had foreign bank accounts and they weren't reporting transactions and the government wanted a piece of that money. And so that's what really brought that into play. But in terms of just the ongoing data collection, it's interesting because you hear all of these intelligence officials say year after year, oh, everything's going dark. We're getting access to less information. People are using encrypted technology. It's dangerous for us. We need to see into every part of your life. And... Actually, the reverse is true. They have never had more data than they do right now. They're like swimming in data. They don't even know what to do with it. But AI is coming along and they're going to have pretty great tools for sifting through that data very soon. And so if I'm to steel man what they're wanting with all of this data, really, they say it's for protection. They say that they can't catch the bad guys without knowing every single detail in your life. And I think the question we have to ask as a society is what is the limitation on seeing into our life? Because we have the Fourth Amendment, which created that balance. And I think it worked pretty well. You know, you can't, if you want to see into someone's life, you need a warrant. You need that warrant to say exactly what you're looking for and where you hope to find it. But if they're sifting through every digital artifact that we're creating in our life, every piece of digital exhaust we're leaving behind, which tells them what our sexual preferences are, what our political interests are, what our you know support like causes that we like to support are, what our family structure is, what our likes are, what, like it tells them everything. If we're now saying that they have the right to sift through all of that and they no longer need a warrant, that's scary territory. And they're kind of using these legal loopholes like the third party doctrine to to justify this. And I think that actually it's making us less secure. I think that, you know, collecting- How so? Well, first there's a liability issue, you know, um, mandating, like let's just take banks. We're talking about the Bank Secrecy Act. If they're mandating that banks collect this obscene amount of data about every transaction that we're making, well, you've got to hope that they're going to protect that data, right? You've got to hope well, they're making them collect it. So surely there'll be repercussions if these banks get hacked and it's all leaked. And then suddenly I'm on the hook for $200,000 because someone, you know, faked my identity. And then I had, I lose five years of my life fighting it in court. And I, you know, this stuff happens actually all the time and there is no accountability. And banks get hacked all the time. There's this great quote by the former uh, president of, of Cisco who says there are two types of companies in the world, those that have been hacked and those that you don't yet know that they've been hacked. And so <laughs> it's like it kind of brings home that, that the government is forcing that all of this data get collected. No one knows how to protect this data. Individuals aren't allowed to protect themselves by withholding this data a lot of the time. And so we're just left in a situation where individuals are left less secure. And, you know, they're protecting the nation state, but I think they're missing the nation's citizens as their top priority. So I think that there needs to be a readjustment of priorities. I imagine you encounter this idea all the time. Like, I have nothing to hide. Mm. Who cares? Who cares? Look at my transactions. Look at my uh, where I go to fill my gas tank, or you know where I take my kids in the weekends. I have nothing to hide. What's the problem? What's your response to that? So I have a couple of responses, and the first one goes back to again that differentiation between the principle of privacy, like dismissing it as a fundamental you know core of a free society, and saying that I don't need it in my life. So I think that the people who are saying I have nothing to hide. What they're doing is, first of all, virtue signaling that they're in complete 100% agreement with the government. So good for you. Like, are you gonna? Are you saying by making that statement that you're always going to be 100% in favor of the government, no matter what policies the government chooses to enact? Okay. <laughs> like I wouldn't go that route because they've had pretty bad history of really bad policies. Like, well, well, and there's also the I am. I have nothing to hide. But if my political opponent wins it's the end of democracy in either direction. (laughs) Those two things are weird to hold in the same mind. And people do it all the time. It's amazing how (laughs) contradictory uh, people can be at any given time. But you hit the nail on the head that people are fine with giving up privacy if they're 
preferred person is in charge. And sometimes people are fine giving it up anyway because they think, well, I at least trust the system of government that allows me to elect someone I might like. And, you know, I trust that, so I really don't care. And I think that's a really privileged position to be making an argument. It, you're basically saying that you don't live in a country where privacy is essential for you to survive. And unfortunately, that's just not the case for billions of people around the world. Uh, if you're a, a, I don't know what I'm allowed to say on this channel where it's going to post, but like, if you're a Yuga, you know, in China, you like, yeah. <laughs> it's a different story. If you're in Iran and you're protesting, it's a different story. Mm -hmm. And so for you to, you know, blase, say ah oh, well privacy who cares it's like all you're doing is virtue signaling how lucky you are to live in a society that isn't targeting you right now that's great but that first of all is not a robust strategy for like future survival given that our data does not go anywhere it is permanent it is a permanent record of us so you're betting that no person will ever want to target you in future and you will never go against what the government says ever. You will never think that they have an abhorrent policy that you want to protest. I, I don't know, I think they have abhorrent policies all the time and I'm quite happy to live in a society where I'm free to push back if I don't like something. I think that that's something that we should encourage in a free society and instead people have started to have this conformist narrative where they're like, well as long as I don't toe the line everything's gonna be fine. Like, oh it didn't end so well for a lot of people behaving like that. So yeah, that's one of the arguments I say with, with nothing to hide. It's just, I think it's a very parochial view and it's kind of a bubble that they live in where they don't quite understand what's at stake. It is this weird thing that is a, seems to be a product of our comfort. I've been thinking about this a lot lately because I, I feel like so many of the things that we see happening in the, in the States and in the rich West are these like wealth diseases <laughs> where, you know, our kids think silence is violence and speech is violence. I, everything's violence, but violence, I guess. And it seems like part of the reason is they don't really actually experience real violence. So they've gotten super sensitive to the next level of discomfort that's quite a bit more subtle than actually like violence. But when it comes to privacy, it's gone in the opposite direction. It's like the comfort hasn't made us more sensitive. It's made us less sensitive and we're all connected now. So there's a lot of examples of people's privacy being violated. We're always hearing about companies getting hacked and oh, now 23andMe or this and that, what, will you name it? You name a company that's got really sensitive information. There is a story of all that information being leaked on the internet. Mm -hmm. I think in the scenario that you uh, explained, when you have a very comfortable life, you tend to invent drama. So you start inventing all of the, you get oversensitized, like everything's bad. But another byproduct of living in that very comfortable life is that you forget what danger is and why you need things like privacy. So I think they're both a byproduct of this very comfortable life. I think that when people are not being attacked and personally targeted for their beliefs or their religious affiliation or whatever, they don't quite understand what's at stake and it takes them having to have a personal experience um, in a situation where their life may be in danger, where they have a mind shift. I mean, just look at, you know, we have wars happening all over the world right now. Yes. One of the prominent ones is the Ukraine and uh, Russia war. And so if you look at people who use encrypted chats right before the invasion of Ukraine and right after, suddenly it skyrockets. Why is that? Well, suddenly you have a hostile nation entering your country and people realize that they need private communication. It didn't just skyrocket in Ukraine, it skyrocketed in Russia. Because if you were anti the war, how are you meant to communicate with your peers in a private way? And so suddenly people start to realize the value of privacy. But it's only when the situation gets that dire that people start to, to realize it. But I think that's too late. I think that we cannot wait as a society for things to get dire for us to start protecting ourselves because all of our data is already out there at that stage. Um, we're scrambling to understand how to use these tools. Now is the time to be learning how to use encryption technology, how to be using things like Tor, how to be taking your data away from all of the companies that are harvesting it and not just selling it to data brokers and to advertising companies, but selling it to governments. Governments are like the largest client of these data brokers. so. We have this weird relationship where we, we look at the private sector and we say, well, why do I care if, if they can see what I'm doing? They're just gonna give me a new pair of shoes. And actually that's not what's going on. If you look under the cover of the 
ridiculously huge uh, online ad business, which includes things like real-time bidding and, and all kinds of shell companies. You just start to peer beneath the veneer of all of that. And you realize how many nation states are literally just using these uh, you know, voluntary services as a tool for harvesting mass amounts of data. And it starts to get really scary. Like, there's a great book. Um, I just finished reading it twice, actually, because I was like, I, there, there's some topics that I come across and I'm, I do research and I'm like, I can't find any information. Maybe I'm just an idiot. And I like dig and I'm like, I can't do it. And then I'll read like a book by someone who's this you know, Pulitzer Prize winning author, whatever. And they'll write a whole book about, I dug into this and I couldn't find any information. And this is a thing we need to investigate. So they'll start pulling these threads and I'm like, wow, this, it's not just that I'm uninformed, it's not that everyone's uninformed, it's that this stuff is being deliberately obfuscated and hidden from us and we do not realize the extent to the invasiveness in our lives because it's it's out of design. <laughs> People are literally designing the system of surveillance and making sure it's as obscure and hard to understand as possible so that no one knows what's going on. Like, I feel like I'm going into conspiracy theory territory and I wish I were. Like, I wish I were. I'm like a normie. I'm a normal, like, <laughs> person, a different degree of music, you know, I shouldn't be talking about this stuff. But you start to look at the details and you start to realize that there's a lot at stake right now. And we haven't yet gone over the cliff. And we could stop this train go going over the cliff if we just start to learn how to protect ourselves. And I think if we don't, I think we're going to lose a lot of freedom. So we have the potential to and that's that's enough, I think, to, to mobilize people. What was this book you read? Twice. <laughs> Twice. All right. His name is Byron Tao. And he wrote a book basically about the insidious relationship between all of these data brokers and ad companies and government surveillance. Because we think of government surveillance, and I used to think of it this way. I'm like, oh, it's this monolithic thing. It's like this blanket that the government has a, an omnipotent, an omnipotent tool, and they flick on the omnipotent switch, and then they see all the things. <laughs> I don't get how it works, but it's something They're like that. They're in Langley, and there's yeah. like this octopus like, turn on the omnipotent switch yeah. it's like it's like that batman scene from uh one of the the, the nolan ones <laughs> exactly the lightning starts spiking that's yeah. how it works that's what the book's about no actually it turns out they don't have lightning coming out of these giant levers that they pull for their surveillance tools it turns out that they're literally using all of the same tools that we voluntarily hand our data over to so if you're giving all of your contents of your emails to Gmail and Gmail is analyzing all of the contents of those emails and forming profiles. All right, I'm going to go on a little bit of a rabbit hole sure. that walk you through. So the Facebooks and the Googles, mm -hmm. we know how much data they collect, right? We all talk about it. Actually, it turns out they don't sell their data outside as much as we think that they do. They have That's these good. internal systems where, no, it's not good, it's terrible, it's still <laughs> terrible, but it's just a different structure than people realize. There are so many weird, obscure shell companies that are data brokerage houses and analytics firms, all of this, that if you dig deep enough, they're run by governments all the time, all the government contractors. And they're literally, their job is to try to get relationships with the Googles and the Facebooks and collect data and then feed it out into these other systems. Now, the way that a lot of this data gets shared is through things like real-time bidding. So we know that Google isn't a search engine. It's an advertising company. That's their business model. That's yeah. what they do. They literally collect profiles uh, about people, put together information about what people like. And then every time you go to a web page, there'll be that split second where you have those empty boxes on the screen and then they fill up. And what's happening there is this instantaneous auction where Google is saying, hey, Naomi's sitting in front of this screen. She just loaded it. She has red hair and green eyes and wears glasses and is Australian. She rants a lot about privacy. Who wants to bid on the opportunity to show her an ad? And then all of these, like you, they'll show that to thousands of companies who are like these approved brokers. Um, and then those thousands of companies, one of them will win and then I'll get an ad for, I don't know, some privacy book. And then I'll be like, ah, oh, we got her. Um, so that's kind of what's, what's going on behind the scenes, right? We got her with the most ironic ad placement ever. <laughs> yeah, right? Like, how did they know? But what's actually going on there, if you think about the mechanics, so Google 
is sending this information to thousands of companies and only one of them ends up paying Google. What are the other companies doing with that data? Because they're yes. still getting the information hmm. and not they don't just know that I have red hair and green eyes and glasses. They know which book I last read. They know which parts I skipped over, which parts I went back and reread. They know what I'm listening to on my audiobook player. They know that I have a ring doorbell and I get X amount of Amazon package. Like they know everything about me. How? How do they know everything? Because they're Just... collecting everything. Well, that's a whole other thing. Well, we could dive into that. But imagine that they have this intensive treasure trove of information about everything. They know me better than I know myself. And then let's say that they're broadcasting that to thousands of people entities and it, they actually published their list of approved vendors who can participate in these real-time bidding systems and if you look at these companies like half of them don't even have wikipedia pages if you try to research them you're like what the hell is this company and then you start to read books like you know by data analytics strategies enterprises enterprise inc, inc. <laughs> legit official definitely not bad um <laughs> vanilla look elsewhere um and you start vandalay to... <laughs> industries dot gov yeah exactly and so you start to get a glimpse of how many entities are just collecting that initial amount of data. And then how many of those entities are probably reselling that data to others. And this just goes on. It's like turtles all the way down. It's selling all the way down. And a lot of those companies really are just government contractors who are then sending it to the NSA and they have these giant warehouses of data about us. But how do they know about us? because we're giving away all that information. Because when you use Amazon, you're signing a privacy policy that says we can share this data with whoever we want. We can use this to target you with ads. We can resell it. You have given us your firstborn child. Like you're, you're like, okay, that sounds great. I didn't want that anyway. This I, was too long to read. Yeah. I just wanted to buy just, some Nikes. I just want socks. So we, we're signing it away. We're using services like Gmail that analyze the contents of our email. We're using SMS, which is all interceptable. Uh, it's completely insecure means of communication. Uh, we're giving away our IP address to every website that we visit so that they can start to make their own portfolios about like, okay, this person is visiting and this is the second time this week she's visited. Uh, we are just just handing over of our own volition mass amounts of data. Like if you look at your phone and we started off talking about Stossel, right? And yeah. like phone apps, whew. Myron talks about that as kind of like this third wave of data brokerage. Like it started off with just kind of like the Lexus Nexuses of the world that are collecting names and addresses and, you know, all of these things. And then you kind of go through these stages of like, he says there are four stages of where it just expands. And then the phone app world is like its whole thing, right? Every app that you use, like I presume on your phone, you've got a bunch of apps that were free. So like who's paying those developers? Right. That's a question people should start asking. It's right? the old question. If you're not paying, you're the product. Right? Yeah. Or like more specifically, if you don't know what this source of funds is, like it could be a donation based, at least then you know what the source of funds is. You know, they don't have a lot of money. But if you've got an app that's like really well funded and you can't quite figure out, well, how are they paying for this? You should start to do some digging. And sometimes you'll have these obscure apps where it's like, I don't know, a compass app or something. And you don't realize that actually one of these other companies has said, hey, I like your compass app and it's this free app and you got a million downloads, that's cool. Um, we can help you monetize. We'll give you a few grand a month if you just put this SDK in your code. And the people go, all right, cool, I, I'll put it in. And then they start getting revenue for their free app that was just a side project. Not realizing that that SDK literally has built into it, collect the entire contacts list of this person, collect every Wi-Fi um, you know, beacon that it comes into contact with, Co collect every network that it ever connects to, Co collect every keystroke that happens in this app. We're just giving permission to these every app basically to collect all of this information, not realizing that it's not even just the app itself that we need to trust with this information, but we need to know who's writing the code base of this and who's injecting their own code. And there's literally in every app that, that you have, um, you, you need to, to be scrutinizing it because the code being injected is just rife. There's a subject you touched on earlier that I wanna like hone in on and see how much you've thought about this. And that is, 
we're in this election year, so, so there's a lot of talk about things like dark money. There isn't as much as there used to be, which is kind of interesting. Um, but are you familiar with the NAACP uh, case around donor privacy? I'm not. Let me through it. Okay. So uh, when you were talking about supporting causes you believe in, it triggered my memory of this because it's something that most people don't realize is the reason why donating to causes being private is so important. And that is that um, the state of Alabama tried to get the lists of financial supporters of the NAACP so that they could harass them in the, um, in, in the Jim Crow South. Wow. And that that court case um, ended up going all the way to the Supreme Court because the right to privately support organizations, you know, you know, this show is, is, is the product of a nonprofit foundation that, that I founded, Emergent Order Foundation, and you can donate to it. So go ahead and do that because it helps us make it look nice. Um, but if you do that, the government will not be able to know who you are. And the reason for that is then they can't come after you if it turns out they don't like what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And and this was this precedent was set by the NAACP's donors being protected from harassment and intimidation. And it, so basically, cancel culture started a really long time ago, and privacy was one of the ways to protect you from cancel culture, including cancel culture about some of the most important issues of our time, our civil rights. And it's it's just one of these things where people throw these words around like, oh, it's dark money and. You know, who are these donors and who is who's supporting what? But it's so easy to to draw from history and show mm -hmm. these instances where things that now we all agree are bad, like Jim Crow segregation is bad, but it used to be popular. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it used to be that you were a dissident if you were standing up for the rights of African-Americans. Mm -hmm. And so your privacy really mattered. So it kind of speaks back to the, your point about we've forgotten what it's like to live in a world where privacy can be life or death. Yeah. So what do you do to protect yourself in this new digital age where privacy is, that's like the quaint old days of like, oh, I, I'm, I have a donor list that's on paper in a filing cabinet mm -hmm. and I'm not allowed, you can't come and seize it, state of Alabama. Mm -hmm. But today we've given it all away. So what do we do to sort of reassert that privacy? And is it just too late? It's definitely not too late. I'd say the first thing you should start with is, is pushing back against this cultural shift. You're right. We hear phrases like dark money, and it's not just applied to this specific case. You hear news reports all the time talking about encryption technology as being used by drug dealers and you know, sex traffickers and you know, bad people. Well, that's true, right? It is being used by those people. And that's all you hear. Like you would think that this was a tool that was designed just to make the world a worse place, right? And, uh, and it's not. This is a fundamental part of living in a free society. So anytime you hear that narrative where it's just being portrayed as, well, it's just these bad people, I think you need to push back against that. And we just can't keep giving in to this, this pervasive narrative that I think is quite insidious, where people are made to feel bad uh, about wanting privacy. I get comments all the time on my videos where people will be like, what have you got to hide? Or right. someone tell her she's not the main character or like whatever, yeah. right? And I, I fundamentally reject the idea that people need to somehow justify wanting to live a private life. They don't. Privacy is normal. I think that's the first step we need to take as a culture is just shift that Overton window back to privacy is normal and go from there. So the second thing that I think people need to do is start to become cognizant of the technological choices they're making. And especially if you have kids, right? Mm -hmm. The tech choices they're, they're making. I have a fun anecdote which um, it will be particularly relevant to parents. So one of, one of my friends, he's a big you know, cybersecurity guy. And um, and he had VPNs installed on all of his kids' apps so that they could circumvent school firewalls. And you're thinking, why? I don't want them to break the rules. Well, was... But I, one thing that parents need to realize is that kids are real tech savvy. And if they want to go on their iPad at school and the school has a firewall blocking them from doing that, they're going to download a VPN on their own 
and they're just gonna bypass it on their own. But the problem is most of the VPNs out there are just shell companies for data collection agencies. This is the thing I worry about yeah. with these. Because it's like, you can be you can be totally private. The only people's servers that will see you are ours. <laughs> no, no, well, it's it's not that bad. You, <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm talking about literally malicious companies that if you, you look into their code, they're literally collecting keystrokes and like mouse movements. Like XPS DP. DPN. Yeah, like definitely just, legit VPN. Very super slightly privacy. Yeah, very slightly name changed VPN. Yeah, so so many of them are shell companies. So you need to protect your children by understanding the reality of the situation is that they're probably going to want to do these things. You can help them do it safely. And I think that's really important to have that conversation and just to say, hey, these are some good VPN providers. Let's get you set up and show you how to navigate the internet safely. Who are good? Who oh, good? Uh, well, I think that like general cybersecurity people like things like Mulvad. Um, they're based in in Switzerland, I believe, and they allow you to pay in cash, which is great for um, VPN, right? They're really doing hard. So you then. can literally you can pay in cryptocurrency, privacy coins. You can um, just send cash in an envelope to them, and then it's not associated with your name at all. So they're great. What about uh, ExpressVPN? I see ads for that all the time. They're always sponsoring podcasts. So, I, I, I'm a user of it, actually. <laughs> Not but, so good. Okay. You should you shouldn't tell people which things they you use because they can specifically <laughs> oh God, target. I'm, I'm already screwed up. <laughs> um, I like Proton VPN. It's another great one. Okay. I so the VPN industry is very interesting if you look under the hood, because you're right in that if you use a VPN, basically what a VPN does is it says, well, instead of going from your home network straight out to the internet, we're going to encrypt your traffic, send it to this server over there, and then send it out to the internet. So it looks like your IP address is this VPN server. Just mm -hmm. a way of masking where traffic is coming from and providing that initial encryption to protect that data as it leaves your network. So that's how that kind of works, but you're right in that the VPN company can see all of your data, all of your traffic. It, I mean, to an extent. So these days we have HTTPS for everything so they can see which like, top level domain you're visiting, but they're not gonna be able to see activities That's uh, unless it's unencrypted traffic, which nothing really is these days. We're like pretty much HTTPS everywhere. So they're like, um, I see you're going to apple.com because there's a new MacBook that you wanna buy but I can't see anything about where you're clicking or your transit or any of that. Basically. Okay. Um, and so when it comes down to it, you're making trade-offs for your privacy. Do I want every single company I use on the internet to know my personal IP address? Or do I want to trust a company and say, you know, you look after my privacy and you're basically masking it. Because I don't necessarily want Bill's florist down the road knowing this stuff or this political cause that I donate to knowing this stuff. Or, you know, I, I just don't need them to know where I'm located. So I think that if you choose a good VPN provider, it just comes down to research and understanding that there is a spectrum of good companies and bad companies always that applies to VPNs. And so you need to do your research and choose a good one. You know, you wouldn't choose a bad car company that is going to have your wheel fall off as soon as you go down the highway and crash. You would do your research, you'd choose a car company that has safe vehicles. So it's the same thing for any product that, that you're purchasing. So that's all techie and I'm a nerd, but a lot of people like my parents and mm -hmm. I think a lot of people would be like, well, how do I know if a VPN, how do I do that? How do I do research to know mm -hmm. If it's good, I go on Google and I search, what's a good safe VPN oh, that's no, no, not a scam? Don't do that because half the VPN companies, like these reports that are like tech reviews that are neutral is like owned by these VPN companies. They own all of these review sites. So well, don't do that. How am I gonna don't research do this? So <laughs> you're gonna look for great organizations. So Freedom of the Press Foundation, which is a fantastic organization. They put out all these guides that show you exactly what to look for and will give you, you know, their top five lists. Um, EFF, Electronic Frontier Foundation. Just find which organizations are looking out for your privacy and uh, causes that you trust because they've done great work Work. maybe they've just like petitioned for good rights in the past find them and see what they're saying because okay. none of us have the expertise we are all trusting certain people in our network and that's just the way society works I'm not you know testing my food every time I eat it to see is there arsenic in it no I'm gonna trust the food company to not have put arsenic in my food so 
there's a certain level of trust for every single thing we do. And it's just about figuring out who are the people in the tech world that I trust. And I think that those organizations are examples of really great places that are looking out for consumers. Okay, so I've gone to one of these often nonprofit organizations, uh, found a VPN, I'm paying cash somehow, so I'm putting Okay, well, let's talk about an cash. envelope let's and cash. mailing it or I something. A, How am I doing that? I got a solution <laughs> for that. So not everyone is ready to jump into the crypto world and use privacy coins. Not everyone is interested in mailing cash to Switzerland or whatever. Um, <laughs> oh, we never got your cash. <laughs> 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 yes, yeah. yes, yes. I'm, um, I assume villainous laughter villainous whenever I... Yeah. But there are services that you can use. Like Right now, the financial system is broken. Anything that touches payment rails is surveilled. You're bad bank is selling your data. Your credit card company is selling your data. They're selling your most intimate details of, of what you purchase and your patterns of behavior and all of that. It's all being sold. No one realizes this, but it's all being sold and shared with countless third parties, right? So understand that and think, well, what layers can I put in front of that, right? If it, And there are a few things to, to think about. It's not just like, I don't necessarily want my bank seeing what I'm doing. It's that I don't necessarily trust the vendors that I purchase from to keep my data safe. Mm -hmm. Because when I use a credit card, that's my private and public key that I'm handing over. And anyone who has that number can make a purchase, which is terrifying. And I'm giving that to what thousands of companies a year that I want to make purchases with online. So there are masked credit card companies that you can use where basically you'll trust them because maybe they have a great privacy policy and they say, we're never going to share your data with anyone um, and <clears throat> we're not going to sell it and we're storing it all with really robust encryption. So if a hacker breaks into our system, we're really, we know what we're doing. We're looking after this. So maybe you'll find a company like that that you really trust. And I think they're a much better alternative than giving thousands of company your credit card number. And so what they do is they'll verify you because you know you within traditional payment rails the government has certain requirements for KYC so sure you, you'll comply with all of that but then instead of giving out your credit card number you can make a different credit card number for every purchase you just click in sometimes you have like autofill options where you go make a payment they'll just oh, autofill it with a different card number instead of writing Naomi Brockwell bought this purchase and giving them my home address because I don't need thousands of companies knowing my home address. I will write Jane Smith and I will write whatever address I want and that purchase will still go through. That will be approved no matter what I put in those fields. And what does that achieve? Well, first of all, you have to understand that all these businesses are going to get hacked eventually. And card skimming is a real thing where all of your data ends up on the dark market. It's sold. People are selling your home address. People are selling your personal details. But if you stop giving those personal details to companies, even when you think it's required, like, oh, it's a financial transaction. This, I better do it for this one. You don't. Use a credit card masking service and protect that data from all of these companies who might sell it or just be careless with it. I had this happen recently. I was looking, um, I, I use a, a card that I th thought was pretty secure. And I, I noticed all these Microsoft transactions. So I'm like, what, what are all these, trans like, like same day, $58, $58. And then, and then I go to my Microsoft account and see they're not on theirs. And I don't know why they would be. It's like in some cases I was traveling. Turns out somebody managed to get a hold of this number and was buying Roblox points. So I, and the question is, is this a child? <laughs> or is it even darker than that? Because they're buying a lot of Roblox, like four thousand dollars worth Dark of Roblox. Markets of Roblox. So I think you can trade these Roblox points. Mm. So God only knows what is actually going on there. The credit card company has reversed the charges, but Microsoft trying to get Microsoft to even have a human respond mm -hmm. is impossible. Mm -hmm. And so it's like I guess they the card got canceled. They can't make the charges anymore. But they haven't been caught? Or I, I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, when I make a purchase now, I can choose, well, is this a single use card or is this a card that I'll use for ongoing purchases with this place? What is the monthly limit? What is the total limit that I want to ever be paid from this card? Oh. I can set all of that. I can have it self-destruct. After this purchase, get, eliminate this card. And it just makes me feel so much better. I could. It actually gives me the freedom to... Um, 
to be more flexible with who I give cards to, knowing that that number is going to be tied to that merchant. No one else can get hold of it and use it for anything else. The way these companies work is once you use it at a merchant, it's tied to that one. And so mm -hmm. it just it makes you so much more secure in your purchases, but it also protects your privacy just from you know, your home address not being given to thousands of companies that can't protect it and sometimes won't protect it because they're actually selling it. So trusted VPNs, uh, masked credit card mm. uh, platforms, companies, those are two, those, those cover, those start to cover a bunch of activities. That's cool. Yeah. What's, what other tools do I need to know about? I, I'm probably on the horrendous side <laughs> of the spectrum. Everyone is though. You'd be surprised. I, I'm sure I'm especially bad because I use so many cloud services and mm -hmm. I, I, I love the productivity that comes from everything being connected and working and mm -hmm. moving from machine to machine with ease. Um, so what else? What else do I need to know to protect myself without it becoming completely impossible to do work? So I'll, I'll take you through, through the first steps that I'll go through. Like the first thing I would do is like, what search engine do you use? I actually started using something called Kagi interesting which is you is a subscription so they don't do advertising you just um i found out about it from a blog i like called daring fireball with this is you know mac blogger john gruber and uh so far it's been pretty good so i pay like 20 bucks a month and i and it installs a little extension in the browser so anytime you type in google.com it redirects to coggy.com mm -hmm. and the search goes through there i just i started doing that um, about a month ago, I think. So you're not on the horrendous side of the spectrum because <laughs> yeah. I can bet that almost everyone says Google. Right. And what Google's happens... search quality has declined to, in my, in my view. I so has like that whole, as... like, don't be evil, uh, policy. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so like Google's literally super creepy, company. super creepy. They say they push it up to the creepy line and don't cross it, but they just Boy, I got a bulldozer and just go right over that. Thing. The creepy line's in hell, by the way. The creepy just, line. So you're already in hell is... when you get to the creepy line. And it's the just creepy a... line is a guy peering over your fence at all times with binoculars. Like, oh, that's creepy. So instead of using Google, you might use, you know, Brave Search or something like that. There are a whole bunch of better ones that protect your privacy. What about DuckDuckGo? That was one of the early ones that was like, no, we're better. We're not tracking you. I have a controversial take there. Um, some privacy advocates do like them and I used to recommend them. They had two foundational pillars and you know what, if you want to use them, great. It's so much better than Google, go for it. But I will give this disclaimer just from my own niche perspective. They came out with two base pillars for their products. One of them was privacy and the other was freedom of speech. It was, we're not going to put you in a filter bubble. We're not going to organize what we think you should see the way that Google does. We're basically going to give you these results and unfiltered. That was a big core principle of theirs. They wrote all these amazing articles about how Google creates this filter bubble and they're only showing you what they want you to see and all this stuff. Confirmation bias. Yeah. And then um, a couple of years ago, they decided that they would start filtering results and uh, eliminating misinformation. And once someone starts becoming an arbiter of truth and they <laughs> lose respect enough for their user base that they don't think their users can be their own arbiters of truth, I lose respect for that company. So that's just my personal take for privacy. I do think they're still better, but I think there are better products out there. I like Brave Search. If you want to use, if you want Google's search results, you can even use something called Start Page, which is like a private front end for Google. It basically just doesn't have an account associated with things. It sends things through a proxy. So, you know, websites can't see your visiting stuff. It's just a more private way to use Google if that's your preference. Okay. And then after search engine, I would say browser is the next easy thing to switch out. You're probably using Chrome or something. I don't, I don't want to know. It don't, it'll hurt. <laughs> I use Safari mostly. Okay. Safari's not terrible. It's not the best. Um, the best Chrome browser. Chrome is just a battery hog. Yeah, Chrome is. And that is another benefit of switching out of that is that you get more battery life. Um, I think that out of the box, Brave has the best privacy protections. That people also like Firefox, but the caveat with Firefox is that, well, first of all, they get paid a ton of money by Google to make Google their default search engine. So they are kind of beholden to Google in that regard. But and also, so does Apple for that. Right, right. Matter. And also, if you want to 
uh, tweak your settings in Firefox, you, you really have to go in and granularly fine tune it to get to the hardening place that Brave provides you with out of the box. So I say if you just want an easy switch, you can import all of your bookmarks, you can import all of your auto fields, password, whatever you want, you can just do that with a click of a button and switch. So I'd say move to something like Brave, but there are other ones that Mulved just came out with a browser and it also seems to fare very well in terms of privacy. There's a great resource out there, I think it's called Privacy, I'm not, I'm not gonna tell the URL because I'm gonna get it wrong, but they compare browsers and all of the privacy features you'd want and kind of give everyone like a ticker across. And I think that Brave and Mulvad are uh, some of the top ones. Okay, so I, we got VPN just to keep- Guys, I say start, got... start with search, Okay. So... then do the browser. Don't even get to VPN yet. Okay, if, like, that's so a technical I'm blank, thing. I'm coming to, to, to Naomi. Mm -hmm. First, like switch out of Google search. Mm -hmm. Get on the Brave browser or mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. Okay. Next, email. Now, this is one the hard one. Of, it's it's not, it and is. I'm here to give you great news. Okay. I am the white pill okay. here. So, the great thing about GDPR, which I know is this kind of behemoth law that is arbitrarily enforced, and people are like, does it really? What achieve? is that? What is GDPR? Oh, so that's a privacy law that the EU has. Um, so the EU is I don't like, like the EU very much. It's okay. We don't need to like the EU, but okay. one of the uh, <laughs> they're always like trying to steal our <laughs> company's money all the time. That's why it's like, oh, what do you got? Something successful? Here's a fine of billions of dollars that we'll just put in our pockets. So uh, but but, ignore, ignore that. Just, okay. just know that one of the positive externalities of GDPR and their privacy laws is that it forced Google to open up a bunch of APIs to the web, which basically are things that allow people to interact with their software. Okay. And I thought they were the reason why we get nagged with lots ignore of. Ignore that. Like, ignore that. That's not what we we've talking got about. cookies. It's like you, <laughs> I, you know that nagging doesn't seem like it's a net good. It's like, I just ignore everything now because it's always a nag. Yeah, that is, that is, you get privacy fatigue for, with things like that. But anyway, um, I'm sorry, I'm taking this No, 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 this, this is a good point. We should circle back. But the, um, the API thing basically means that they had to expose all these APIs to the web. And so it, is now trivially easy to migrate the entire contents of your Gmail inbox to another provider because they had to kind of crew, you know, make those available. So okay. uh, services I would recommend, I love Proton uh, Mail. I think they're fantastic. Tutor Nota is another great, um, they're now called Tutor. They've gotten rid of the Nota. Not to, no, I was gonna do a pun. We we'll ignore that I was gonna try and make something funny. I'm not a funny person. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so I would choose one of those two, but if you go into um, Proton, for example, there's yeah. literally a button you can click. It says migrate the contents literally ingests all of your mail. The difference between Gmail and Proton Mail is okay. that Gmail is analyzing the contents of every private communications that you get and adding that information to their profile about you. Google is an ad company, we established that. Why are they giving away this free email service? Because they learn a ton of information about you. That's the reason. So here's a question about that. Um, you can pay for some of these services with Google, like like the, especially on the on the business side. So if you want to give more of your money to a company that has shown such little respect for their users that they obfuscate the privacy settings and do not disclose how many people that they're sharing your personal intimate details with and even lying about who gets access to the contents of your inboxes. Go ahead, but I say vote with your money and choose companies that respect you as a user and that will build a better internet future. And I think there are plenty of them out there. And I think it's important that we support these companies. It gives a market signal that says, hey, we value privacy. I wanna see more of this stuff. And that's the only way we're really going to change the state of things. So Proton, okay. what they do is they have all kinds of encryption to protect your emails. So if you email someone within the Proton network, it's all end-to-end -end encrypted. They can't see a single thing that goes on. But what if someone from Gmail emails you, right? Well, what Proton Mail does is they encrypt that too, but with your private key. So they even take that out of their own reach. And so oh, everything okay. that's in their in ecosystem, they do not have access to and they cannot get access to. And so I just think it's a, a fundamentally better product to choose. They have a whole suite. So you get you know end-to-end -end encrypted mails, uh, a calendar, I mean. So if you think about the intimate details that your calendar gives away about you, oh, like yeah. like the history of everyone you've ever seen at exact times, your history of movement, 
Imagine like how valuable that data is to them. Proton Mail, they can't see I knew this conversation thing. was going to like make me <laughs> creeped about my own No, it's meant life. to make you feel empowered. Yes, yes, like, that's what's happening. Like there are easy steps, okay, low yes. hanging fruit, where it's literally <laughs> importing so, my calendar. It was like a big barrier for me. I was like, oh, but I'm in Google. I don't want to, I have to move it over I, because I'm used to this. You know I'm what? I'm getting empowered and generalized anxiety disorder at yeah, the same absolutely. time. <laughs> Okay. And literally, as soon as you realize how easy it is, your anxiety goes out the window. You just go to their calendar app, you click the migrate your calendar from Google, and it just automatically imports everything. You never have to open your Google calendar again. It's that easy. So that's why I'm telling people like there is hope. All of this data that we're handing out there and it goes to all these places, it trickles down to the turtles, you know. <laughs> um, we, it we strangles them like strangles like uh, like those things that coke cans come. That's exactly right. We can just snip those little little big data collection tools and uh, and reclaim our privacy by making these simple switches. And I think it's going to be so much better for people when they do that because suddenly you feel more empowered. I think one of the most insidious parts of pervasive surveillance in a society is that we lose the ability to think freely. I think that's dangerous. I think that we have this understanding that we are being watched at all times and that seeps into the culture where suddenly we say things that we think will look better in a digital profile than something that we genuinely feel. We place more value on this digital persona than on our true selves. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the things we, we stop being able to grow as human beings. You know, our conversations used to be ephemeral when we were younger. We'd say hi, that conversation was like, you know, is left to the, our fallible memories of the people who were there. These days they're etched into a permanent digital record. And what does that do to our psyche? Well, suddenly we have, you know, this permanent self that we feel, you know, it, it is something that might embarrass us if suddenly we're changing our minds. So maybe instead of opening our minds and changing beliefs as we get more knowledge, we start to dig into entrenched beliefs because it's something that we've said publicly online and we kind of need a hold to that. Like our whole world changes when we have this permanent digital world that we're etching into these records that people are just collecting about us. And I think we need to make a shift, a, like a, a cognitive shift a society and Think like, do we think about retention? You know, do I need to be keeping a record of every email I've ever sent, or can I have them self destruct after 10 years? Like, pick whatever number you want, but do you want like everything as this liability about everything you've ever said or done in private, or what you thought was in private with someone just being there in a culture that's constantly shifting and targeting people for dissenting viewpoints? You know, we also have shifted to a world where suddenly we're a more conformist culture because knowing that everything we do is etched permanently online and is shared with so many entities, well, suddenly there's more of a risk to speaking out. Suddenly yes. there's more of a risk to going against the grain. I think that's something we need to grapple with as a society and think, is it worth it? Or can we let go of these permanent digital identities and maybe embrace the ephemeral a little more? Go go back to that. I think there's something beautiful in having transient conversations that disappear and fly off. <laughs> they can be transient and yeah. recorded by lots of cameras. And at the same transient time. <laughs> for posterity, Harris. Um, so the next thing that I'd say people choose is stop using SMS, which again. They're collected um, and they're interceptable and they're not private at all. Use encrypted messaging services like Signal. And I have all of mine set to auto destruct after four weeks. It's enough time for me to save any precious ones that I like, save any photos that I like, and the rest of them disappear. And there's something freeing about having that ephemeral communication. Uh, I think that the trade off is, is absolutely worth it. I think that's really interesting, this idea of of the sort of almost um, subliminal cultural impact of this, uh, it is a chilling effect. Yeah. You know, I, I remember, I, I want to say it was in the before COVID times, I had this conversation with um, Balaji. <laughs> BC. Yes, 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 yes BC. <laughs> um, Balaji Srinivasan, and he was talking about like wokeism. And mm -hmm. he, he was the first person I heard describe the philosophy as being Maoist. Interesting. And talked about s struggle sessions, and I hadn't mm. really fully gotten into this. Well, I think it's become kind of common now. We talk about mm. like Maoism and this and this sort of culture of silence, but 
this is like a completely different way that this happens. That mm -hmm. Just the kind of background assumption that you know you're leaving this trail. So maybe I shouldn't think that. Or maybe, oh, I'm super conservative. And if I start to be unsure about one part of it, do I really want to say that? Do because, I really want to leave that payment trail? Yeah, or vice versa. Really... Or, I'm, yeah. you know, I'm super liberal. But now, hmm, I don't know about what's happening with immigration. But I can't mm -hmm. say anything because my friends, like, yeah. It's it's um it is weird. I don't know that I've heard anybody dig into that um in quite that way. The way like say Jonathan Haidt's talking about the anxiety and the mental health mm -hmm. issues. It's like it's a it's a version of that. It's like you think about the panopticon, right? It's a great symbol for pervasive surveillance. So for panopticon, those that don't know what that is, describe it. So imagine a prison, it's circular, all of the inmates say on the outside, and in the center there's a tower and there's a single guard but the prisoners can't see who's looking at. And so they start to self-regulate their behavior because if you don't know if someone's looking at you, but you think they could be looking at you, suddenly your behavior starts to become modified. You, you can look at Orwell's 1984 as another example mm -hmm. of this. People's behavior starts to become modified when they think they're being looked at. Or, or that it's even possible that they might be. Exactly, because mm -hmm. if you if it's if the surveillance is per pervasive and like let's just look around this room for pervasive surveillance or think about the average living room, right? In the yeah. average living room, you've got the Alexa device that's listening to you. You've got the ring doorbell that's capturing conversations from your living room and also pointed at your neighbor's yard across the street and capturing you know things from the the sidewalk. Uh, you've got your computer and the microphone. You've got every app on your phone that you've given camera permissions to and you've given microphone permissions to and you've given your lo exact location data to and your entire contacts history like just think about all of the things in your life that are just sitting there collecting information and just sending off data and we know that's happening even if we don't quite understand the ways that it's going on that sinks in and we start to modify our behavior and i think that chilling effect on society is insidious and we really need to reclaim private spaces in our lives so we've known each other a long time and we've met through sort of like libertarian nerddom and um econ nerds <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> um and the fed um has has spending time looking at this um data economy made you more worried about free enterprise because so there's this book that and this woman who wrote it got sort of popular around the time that that movie The Social Network came out. I think she called it surveillance capitalism. Mm -hmm. And it has been this interesting challenge that even folks on the so-called right that are free marketeers will be upset about big tech. I'm putting scare quotes around a lot. But it is an interesting challenge when you have such a pervasive thing going on that's this multi-layered set of incentives. How do you think about that just from a has it challenged you philosophically when you think about the free market and private enterprise and companies competing and is are we in a different phase of c capitalism we're definitely in a different phase but i don't think it's what most people think i think that truly free enterprise is absolutely what we need to be steering the ship back towards but what we have currently is not that because the boundaries between private and government have completely melded and no one really understands it. Like I was talking before about this, this book that I, I was reading and it's going into, so the reason I like this book is it took this guy five years to write it and he sued the government in the process for like different FOIA requests to get information. So he's really diving into how all of this data collection works and it's, and they just kept denying him his freedom of information requests. They're just like, no, we don't want you to know about it. So he starts to uncover details like, okay, well, there's this big government contractor. And first of all, no one says they're a government contractor. Like one major company accidentally kind of put on their website a bunch of them. And then they just got like eliminated and gradually all of those companies that they wrote, like it's just like, it's a, you don't do it. They got scrubbed so quickly uh, from, oh. from their website. But if you look at the clauses that these data brokers and um, contractors Right, it is when they kind of do this interface between government and these companies that they're collecting data from, they will say, you cannot use us in court cases. You cannot mention that this is how we're collecting data. You cannot talk about certain things. This can never be brought up. 
So there is this enforced veil of secrecy about how this collection is going on because they literally, this, this collection processes only work if we don't know about them. Because as soon as we start realizing that our apps are just collecting everything, will we just stop using the apps, right? But the problem is, is that they've gone, like all parties involved, have gone out of their way to make this as secretive as possible. So it kind of seems like it's like, hey, if this were really a big deal, wouldn't everyone be talking about it? Why isn't right. there? So I'll just ignore it too. But we're getting to the stage where more and more stuff is being uncovered and people are like, no, this is actually a real thing and we need to be really concerned about it. And so I think that when we talk about private and government as being these separate entities, we're thinking about the 1970s and the 1980s and maybe even the 1990s, right? When you go to your Blockbuster video and the brick and mortar store, they get your name and they get your phone number and they know what you rented last week. And that data collection stops there. And if the government wants that data, they need to get a court order for that specific Blockbuster, right? And now we have the equivalent of the Blockbuster app that's collecting, you know, voice recordings for targeted advertising. And it's looking at our contacts list and it's looking at all the phone numbers in our contacts list. And it's looking at our, you know, our history of our travel movements, and our gyroscope and how fast we're moving at any given time, which direction we're pointing. They're seeing whose vicinity we're hanging out. Like it's a constant stream of data. And not only are the companies collecting more, but the government is getting direct access to all of this just by, you know, buying data from the data brokers who are inserting code into these apps or maybe they're through government programs like PRISM that have direct access to the servers of these companies or through any number of these programs like Tempest, Turmoil, Turbulence. In the UK, there's um, they're Tempura. They like the T words. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> and so it gets to this stage where there's so much data collection going on that, and the government's just getting all of it, that that boundary gets blurred. But then you look at the, compa the companies that are pushing back against the data collection, right? What happens to them? Well, there are companies that push back and say, no, come back to us with a warrant. But then you start to see like more antitrust cases come up and then you start to see like more government enforcement and then the Twitter files, right? Yes. We found out that we had FBI agents literally working at Twitter to do thought police on people and see which tweets were accessible and which were not. So that's an, a really interesting point you're bringing up about the antitrust because the thing that I noticed, so I'm like a super Apple nerd and Apple, among the big companies, has probably more than any other one planted a stake in the privacy um, issue and said, mm -hmm. look, we are, they run ad campaigns. Every time Tim Cook talks about it, he says privacy is a human right. So at least rhetorically, that they do seem like at every turn they're trying to enable end-to-end mm -hmm. -end encrypted technologies. And the an early litmus test for me was I believe it was the San Bernardino mm -hmm. shooting. Yeah. And I thought, okay, so here's like an attack and there's all this political heat. Let's see if they turn over the iPhone data to mm -hmm. the FBI. And they didn't. They said, sorry, no, we don't, that, we don't do that. Mm -hmm. And that kind of gave me a, a sense that Apple's not a bad guy. Yeah, they did compromise though. They had planned to roll out end-to-end -end encryption for iCloud all the way back then, 2016. Yeah. Um, and then they said, okay, we'll give you that. We won't end-to-end -end encrypt iCloud. Everyone's backups will still be open, but we're not gonna give you over this phone. I think now everything is is completely Almost, end -end almost everything. You have to only, opt into something. Yeah, only if you turn it on. Um, so, so yeah, yeah how, what's your opinion of Apple's ecosystem writ large? Because especially I know for, for for our kids, for young young people, I mean, I'm an iPhone user, but uh, iPhone market share among young people is really high. So mm -hmm. how should we think about the, secu the, the privacy claims of Apple and its ecosystem? Well, I would say that stock iOS, like stock Apple phones, are way more secure and way more private than stock Android. So you're already making a great decision there. I would say that Apple collects way more data than they should. If you run a program on your computer, like a, I won't get into technical details. Yeah. I actually just released a video um, this morning about it. We'll put a link in the yeah, comments. Yeah, it's basically like this reverse firewall. So generally like your firewall is gonna stop incoming traffic. And this one is saying, listen, 
Your computer and all the programs on it at any given time are pinging all these centralized services and sending information about what you're doing on the machine. And people don't realize. They don't know that all that information is being collected. And even if you're using your computer offline, there are programs that start running that collect in the background. Next time you connect to the internet, these computer programs start off, they send off all your data. And so you can have these reverse firewalls that block these connections. So I did a video about how to install one of these and just start to monitor how many data requests. Where are you leaking data to the internet? Yeah, and Apple is egregious. They want to collect everything. So kind of the choice you have is... And when you say Apple in this case, are you talking about like each of the apps on your Mac or... I mean that your Mac OS, the literally the operating system, is sending so much telemetry about all the things that you're doing and you're not aware of it. But basically what it comes down to, I still think that Apple is better than Windows. Like, far better because like with something like windows you're basically saying you can take my data and do whatever I want, you want with it you know the, you, i'm going to be screwed no matter what and this is Forget the situation it, yeah. with apple they're saying we're the only ones who are going to screw you so that's kind of the trade-off <laughs> that you make or you can choose something like a linux distro that you know doesn't have some central repository collecting information and then there's like oh we believe in privacy actually so like I think on the spectrum, Apple does way better than Windows. So if you, uh, and does way better than Android. So if you are using an Apple phone and an Apple computer, like for example, if you compare Google Maps to Apple Maps, yeah, Google is collecting every single bit, like that your location data is so important to them. Um, and they're using that in, in all kinds of different ways. Apple actually makes uh, a lot of effort to make sure that that data is pseudonymized. So they're adding in noise to the data. They use a technique called fuzzing, where instead of storing the exact history of where you requested to go in maps, it stores a general vicinity. So they actually make things harder on themselves in order to protect people's privacy more. Should I not even have Google Maps installed on my phone? Like, it depends like, what you have. So if you have an iPhone, yeah, just delete Google Maps. You don't need it. Apple Maps used to be bad. Now it's great. Yeah, I'm, I use Apple Maps, yeah. so I like it. I like so it So just delete Google Maps. If you have an Android phone, unfortunately, there aren't many um, uh, alternatives. Like, there are things like uh, OSM and, and organic maps, but they're really kind of these community-driven projects that if you're in an area that doesn't have good coverage, it's not going to give you great directions. I would say have both. I would say use organic maps and all of these things when you can. You can also use them entirely offline. So you can download the maps. So it yeah. means if you don't have coverage, these are actually better because you can just open up organic maps and you can find where you are even without coverage. I personally use a graphene phone, so it's not Android and what it's not that? iOS. It's based on something called the Android Open Source Project. So it's kind of like a super stripped down version of Android, but graphene goes out of its way to harden it and make it as private as possible. So I can granularly control everything. I should have brought my, my phone in here, but like I have two different profiles and on my secondary profile I have Google Maps in case I need it. But every time I close that profile, it completely cuts off any app on so that like, secondary profile so from it's like access, it's completely sandbox. And they do that even outside of the um, profiles as well. They are so good at siloing apps and functionality, and they do not give the same intimate level of access that something like Android does to your entire phone and what's going on on the device. So I love Graphene. It's not like a product you can buy. You flash it yourself. So it's kind of you know left to the nerds to do this. Yeah, yeah, this I have is... a great video that explains it, but it can be like, it, it's for some people, like I've, I've probably done dozens and dozens and dozens of installations. I don't for see a beard under your neck, but it's but there. You, it's there. It's, it's makeup. Hidden. I've covered it up. <laughs> yeah. um, so I, I've done so many installations for people. If you are installing and you're installing from a Mac computer, your graphene, it'll be a seamless process. If you're installing on a Windows machine, you're gonna encounter so many issues. And I think I've troubleshooted every possible issue that could go wrong. So I'd say if you're adventurous, you wanna try installing graphene and you have a Mac computer, do it. It's gonna be easy and you're gonna end up with so much more privacy. It's super simple instructions. You just walk through like, it's, it's great. I love it. So much more privacy. Windows, get someone who knows what they're doing to help you. That's <laughs> gonna be my um, advice. Okay, so I recently, um did a thing that most people will, will not do, which is I, I installed a different stereo system in my in my car, which I got off 
AliExpress. Ha. So I've, I'm sort of like inviting the CCP into my car, perhaps. I don't know, but it's They're an Android. Th- it, well, it's like triple bad because it's like a it's like a Chinese deal that's a that's an Android operating system. <laughs> so it's all the worst. But what about my car? Uh, you know, w- what about cars in general? What's the situation with privacy and all? I, I like I saw that GM is now not allowing people to use the Apple CarPlay. Because they seem to believe that their car operating system is going to be this big revenue engine, which was like a red flag to me. Like, what, what, what's this all about? So now I'm p- paying a subscription to use the interface in my car. Help me un- understand, like, what's the car deal I'm for privacy? I'm really sorry. There is no good alternative. You can get a bicycle. Um, I, cars... So I'm uh, not that much worse by getting yeah. like, the cheapo Chinese knockoff like head unit. I'm, it's just, it's all terrible. So it's interesting because we have companies like Apple that are saying, here's the Apple phone and here's the Apple computer and here's the Apple home entertainment system. We're starting to say like, oh, I can add privacy to these different areas. We don't yet have the Apple car. They just canceled um, it. Yeah, exactly. So no, no <laughs> chance, not gonna happen. Yeah, and even then, you know, I, I feel like the privacy narrative in general has not, like, we're just waking up to it. It hasn't yet been applied to cars. And cars are horrendous and so much worse than you realize. Really? If you have ever read a privacy policy from a brand new car, it probably, there are companies, and I'm not even joking. We're filming your kids in the back seat. Oh, I wish we're, we're that were the, Just, we're I gross. wish that were the worst of it. Yes, they're filming your kids, but they're literally saying we have permission to track your sexual activity. They what? have that written into their clauses sometimes. There are companies, yeah, so there are companies that what have- that? Wait a second, huh? I'm not joking. I'm You've actually joking. seen this with your own eyes. We are with we- my own eyes, and Mozilla just put out a report that say they have this great website called Privacy Not Included, where you can look at different apps and see how creepy they are on the creepy scale. And they just put out a report on cars, and we actually just did a, um, a deep dive investigation to cars as well. The they United Auto Workers Union so is in your bedroom by way creepy. of your car. <laughs> so it kind of it. it it started out like if you think of your car, we kind of think about them like, okay, well, they're a vehicle. It's like this private box with mm-hmm. wheels that takes me where I want to go. No, your car is a smartphone on wheels. It is a, a system with hundreds of computers bolted on top, the same way that you have a phone with hundreds of apps yeah. on top. And each of those computers is sending data out to countless entities. And how are they sending data? That's a great question. Well, every car has a SIM card in it these days, so they're just sending out all that data just by having cellular connectivity. And you can remove that, but quite often it will break your car. Or every time you go to the dealership, they're either exfiltrating that data or they're hooking up. It's programmed to literally connect to the SSID that they want it to connect to automatically, and the dealership probably has that SSID. So it's just connecting to the Wi-Fi automatically. Um, Or you're connecting it to your home Wi-Fi, because people do that for some reason, and it's using your home Wi-Fi to send off information. So your car is this data harvesting machine that sees everywhere you travel, sees the people that you meet, is literally taking camera footage, is literally taking microphone audio uh, in the car as well. And like, so that's just the data collection side. And then we haven't quite yet come to terms with how hackable these systems are. So I'm not just talking about the legitimate ways, legitimate ways that we've signed over and said, these people get your data. I, one of my favorite things to do is go to hacker conferences and I love them, things like DEF CON and they're also terrifying. So I kind of need to take some like anxiety, I don't know, meditation sessions after something. Go to a black hat conference with some value. Oh, basically, because <laughs> there are people who will give a presentation about how they, yeah, they literally just hacked into someone's camera in their car and then actually through that got access to their home address and find out the entire medical history of this person, got access to their contact list. Like the, these cars are so hackable that it's insane uh, because right now- well, they have all these cameras. So you drive into your garage and they've got all these cameras. They've got so. all these cameras. So you can literally see when people are home, where they are. Okay. You look at your car app for these modern cars, all the things that you can access 
you know, remotely, someone else can access remotely, so they can see your camera, they can get access to all this data. And that's just the tip of the iceberg because there are all of these computers that are sending data they're not getting access to. So like your tire pressure monitors, every car it was mandated um, by the government that every car tire has to have this tire pressure monitor on it. And so that's actually pinging out, you know, a certain amount of hertz that people are now collecting as just a tracking tool to see movement of vehicles. And, and like it's, it, and it's like basically what these tire pressure monitors are saying like it's they're not connected through a wire to this computer they're sending out this radio signal and the radio signal is basically saying i am tire xyz unique identifier one two three and my current tire pressure is this so if you're sending out a unique identifier Why does the government care about my tire pressure be for safety so it was it was deemed to be safer for a car to be uh using computers to manage tire pressure so you get that little beep that says your tire is yeah. low so we don't blow out tires also you got to realize when you're turning a corner these days you're not the one making that turn you're car is very smartly like they, the technology is amazing your car is very smartly saying okay well i can tell that this tire has slightly lower pressure if you take this corner and you're currently going 60 miles per hour actually that's going to be a bit dangerous so i'm going to make the turn not as you know sharp as you're actually making it and so your car is actually doing a lot of the driving for you these days computers are managing a huge amount that we don't even realize so yes it, there is a safety element there and then the byproduct of that is so much more yeah, what does that have to do with sharing it on wireless so broadcast. It's, yeah, well, it's just being wirelessly broadcast to your central computers in your car. Oh, okay. And so, but that can also be picked up by uh, antennas. Um, and also, like, scarily, I went to this, I, I recently went to ShmooCon, which is a conference in DC, and uh, this guy opens up his, like, pelican case of dark materials and uh, he's got this big <laughs> antenna he's like see this antenna here i'm like yes and he's like and see all of these numbers here and i'm like yes those numbers are going through this wall and through that wall and through that wall and this radio is picking up the tire pressure signals from all of the cars passing by so i i can actually keep this as a database and i've been doing this for a while so i can actually see okay these people i've seen before these are the areas that i've seen them through you can just start to map people's locations oh, because it's like every one of these things if it's enough unique if there's enough unique data mm -hmm. points it becomes a kind of fingerprint it becomes a fingerprint exactly but this is stuff. This is like stuff that I don't think people can worry about right now. We okay. don't have solutions. I'm gonna file this under. File this it's all under. Gonna be fine. Terrifying, but I'm useless. gonna walk the dog in the morning and not think about this. Yeah. Okay. I would right. say the best thing you can do. Let's just start the conversation. When you go to buy a car, just ask your dealership. Hey, can you show me the privacy policy? Hey, can I opt out of any of this? Can I choose not to have remote start, you know, or whatever? Because I see that's a feature that you're now selling to see every time I start my engine. Just have a conversation because the more we normalize these conversations, the more our society is going to start to prioritize privacy. But on top of that, I think that the average person, like because there aren't really car solutions right now, don't focus on that. Focus on the low hanging fruit, fruit that you can control, like the email and the you know SMS or whatever. Yeah. And the thing that you can do um, that I didn't mention, which is another thing, it's kind of I'd say mid level in the spectrum. We've got email and browser and all that, the easy end. Cars. Ah, good luck. And then in the middle, <laughs> there are things that might seem a little inconvenient. But let me ask you this. When you leave this room, are you going to leave the lights on or are you going to switch them off? Uh, switch them off. Hmm. Have you ever thought about switching off the lights on your phone? And what I mean by that is you have so many different radio signals that are just beaconing all the time. You're just turning it off? You don't even need to do that. Just go to airplane mode? So airplane mode is one setting that you can just switch off when you're not expecting a call or not making a call. And that stops your phone communicating with cell towers, which is triangulating your exact position and your location data is being sold um, and is easily buyable. Uh, so if someone knows your cell phone number, they can look you up in databases, they can pay to access these databases, they can see where you are. Um, so airplane mode just stops you talking to cell towers, which is great. You've got Bluetooth. Mm -hmm. Bluetooth is literally shouting out the you know MAC address of your device. It's a unique identifier, seeing if there's anything it can connect to. So people are using BLE, so Bluetooth Low Energy, to map people around airports and in shopping malls and see how long they stayed in this aisle. And you know, can we then send them targeted advertising after we connect with them on their email? Like they're using BLE as a tracking tool. Just turn your Bluetooth off. You're not using it. 
Wi-Fi. If you're not connected to a Wi-Fi network, your phone is, so, well, sometimes there are probe requests, so like your access point is saying, hey, I want to connect. But sometimes your phone will automatically connect to things. And the way that it does that is it basically has a list of your known networks that right. you, you've yeah. you know, connected to. It says like, uh, you know, Naomi's home Wi-Fi, are you in the vicinity? And it's just shouting that out. But it's shouting out like the list of the networks that you've connected to. Oh, so that's awesome. a unique fingerprint as well. So people can see the list of networks that my phone mm -hmm. is trying to connect yep. to periodically. Yeah, and their phones have been making changes to make that more privacy focused. Like they do this thing called like a wild card, but like it's, uh, it's most phones still are going to be broadcasting Here's too all much the networks information. I have. Yeah, way too much information. You can just turn your Wi-Fi off. Uh, and even when it's not, you're still broadcasting your, your MAC address um, once people connect to it. So just be careful, you know, which networks you're connecting to. And if you're not using something, switch it off. Just like we leave the room, we switch off the light, start switching off the light on your phone. Um, it can still be on. You can still use most of your apps probably. You can probably still use your camera if you want to, but just know which parts of the phone are tracking you and which ones you can medicate. I, I would be very careful of giving any apps location services. I would just deny those permissions and not download those apps. Do They're you, all selling that data. Is it um, a good idea to periodically just delete all the apps yes. you don't use? Because oh, I'm, I'm yeah. this is what I've got. I don't even know. I've got like 400 apps mm -hmm. and most of them I never touch. Yeah. So just delete them all. Oh my God, just delete them all. People will be like, oh, what is this leaf in the garden? I know, I'll download an app, it'll tell me. I, and that was six years ago and they've never used it since. But I have that app. someone's paying them two grand you know, a year to put this little SDK in their code that's collecting your exact location that's then being sold to data brokers. Delete the app. And the next app, like if, here's the thing, if you haven't used an app in the last month, delete it. Is it, if, is if there you a setting again, for that? On, I wish. No. Like just just auto delete apps that haven't been used in more than X amount of so time? So Graphene actually has a kind of similar thing where if you haven't used something in a while, it will just start disabling permissions on it, which is really cool. Oh, that's great. So Graphene's great. But um, if you're, uh, if you haven't used something in the past month, worst case scenario, you need the app again and you just install it again. But hopefully when you go to reinstall it, you'll be mindful enough to just read the permissions that it's asking and say, wait, why is this calculator app asking for my microphone? You know, start to be discerning about right. that stuff. And I think we can make better choices the more informed we are. One thing we haven't talked about is social media. Mm. And um, so is there any, is it, is there anything that we should do or think about from a privacy perspective, or is it just, it, it's sort of inherently not private? And maybe, maybe I should just say, we've already talked about sort of messaging apps like Signal, but as a parent, A, I don't think you should give your kids social media until they're pretty close to adulthood, but <laughs> um, let's say they're demanding that they need to have access to Instagram because all their friends are on Instagram or TikTok. And uh, through that privacy lens, how do you think about social media and how should I as a parent think about it? Mm -hmm. There are a few things I'd recommend. First of all, have a talk with them about how to use these apps safely. So Instagram is a great example. You need to be so careful of what you're showing in your photos. If you're showing anything in the background, do you know what it is? Can people figure out where you are from that information? Hmm. There are probably three things I think people should be mindful of when they post a photo on something like Instagram. So first of all, is there any writing anywhere? Am I wearing a lanyard? Is there a logo of a building? You know, if there's writing in the background, if there's an accidental Amazon package sitting there with a the home address, you know, just be really careful. Is the number of my house visible in the back of this picture? Can someone see the outside of my house? be really mindful of what people can see in pictures and just train them early on of how easy it is for people to find you if they want to find you from all of this data. It's incredibly easy. There's this great guy, uh, Jose Monkey. I interviewed him. I haven't put it out yet. Is his name really Jose Monkey? I hope, I hope, I hope that so. he's using an alias because he's <laughs> a TikTok celebrity, but he, Ask people, he finds people that ask to be found. So people will say, hey, Jose, where am I? And they'll be like, you know, they, you can't really see anything. There'll be like a building or and whatever. And he finds them. And he finds them because actually we don't realize what kind of identifying features are around us. 
it, you know, the, the signs that are on light posts are distinct depending on which state you are, which country you are. They have, you know, is it a wooden post or is it a concrete post? That actually can tell you which area you're in, what kind of like, is it asphalt? Is it, you know, dirt road? Is it like, there are so many ways that people can actually, if they want to find you. But I'd say just start with, you know, writing and be careful if you're taking any photos around the outside of your house. Okay. I would also say, teach them not to post things in real time. If they're at the beach and they're like, I need to snap a selfie right now, snap yeah. that selfie, but don't upload it yet. Don't ever show where you are in real time because that is dangerous and you should not be giving anyone that real time data. Before so, you so that's a really great reminder. Mm. And, and that's a reminder that my wife's been really good about for me. Like. Um, I travel, so she's like, do not, if you're, if you're at a conference, don't post any conference pictures while you're there. You're basically telling the world that you're not here home with me mm -hmm. and your son, mm -hmm. um, which I hadn't really thought about. Yeah. But it's like, oh, you're right. You're basically letting people know that the man of the house isn't there to protect his family. Yeah. Um, or if you're a kid and you're on spring break, which is coming up in a week. Oh, here I am in Cancun. Yeah. Yeah, that's a bad idea. It's a really bad idea. And I think kids don't quite realize those risks. Um, so just teach them to just delay that instant gratification. Data is baked into every photo and you need to realize that your GPS coordinates are baked in. Now, luckily, social media these days has gotten good at stripping out that before publishing. So if you post to Instagram, they're going to strip out that exif data and, you know, they're not going to broadcast it to the wider world. But not every blog is like that. So and be it careful. Does some, it does sometimes auto tag. like Yeah. Turn off location. geolocation. Do okay. not turn on geolocation, eliminate that data. That's a really big priority. Um, but yeah, I would say that even if a company is stripping out that exif data before showing to the broader population, they still collect it. So the social media company itself knows and the employees probably have access to it. And there are hundreds of thousands of tech employees, you know, like, so just be aware of who's getting your exact location. You can strip out that data easily. Actually, Signal is a great method. They're great with photos. Um, and they strip out every bit of EXIF data from your photo, which is basically just the metadata that goes into a photo that shows like, well, make a model of a camera and the location and whatever. Yep. Um, and so they strip all of that out every time you send a picture. So if I send, want to send someone a photo, I generally will just send it to myself in Signal and I'll just send that, I'll just save that picture that I received because there'll be no EXIF data in that. Um, and then a more extreme thing, I'm a public person, so I have social media. Yep. I do not have social media on any of the phones that I carry around with me and use my day-to-day -day life. I have them on a single device that I silo and keep it at a very specific location. Um, and that just means that the phone, that phone isn't seeing all the people I'm meeting, all of the Wi-Fi network I'm coming into contact with. They're mm. not my day-to-day -day driver. So it's like not showing all of the intimate activities I'm doing on my phone. It is a silo device specifically for when I intentionally want to use that app. So you want to post on Twitter, you pull out the social phone yep. and it doesn't have your contact list or any of that stuff. Or I will use a browser on my computer because it is more private to use a browser on your computer, which is going to, again, silo stuff better than your phone is, which just has more invasive permissions for general things, gets location data, all of that. Whereas yeah. when I'm in my browser and with my VPN running, there's no cell network that I'm pinging off. It's just a fundamentally more um, private platform to be doing that stuff from. It is an interesting thing because the phone in one sense is a more locked down platform than like Mac OS or, or Windows. You can mm -hmm. install, it's easy to install software on both of those platforms. It's easy to get in and mess with the operating system. But the phone is super intimate and has all these sensors that yeah. the computer still mostly don't have. A gyroscope, accelerometer, like all it's amazing stuff. what you can actually tell about a person's activities just from all these sensors that we have on the phone. So photos, location data, and being able to see where, where you're at. What else from in, in social media stuff should I be paying attention to, especially as a parent? You know, if, if I'm going to let my kid go on these platforms, what other advice do you have? Tell them to be really careful who they befriend because there are lots of people who are going undercover and creating fake profiles. And as soon as they open up their network to 
other people, they could see far more about their uh, personal activities. And so sometimes, you know, you can lock down profiles and say like, well, only certain people in my friends can see this. But sometimes we can be tricked into adding people as friends who we don't actually know, but they may strike up like internet conversations and things. And this Meet happens- Meet on World of Warcraft and next thing you know. Yeah, it, it happens all the time. Uh, there's a thing called pig butchering which is a prevalent scam on the internet. Which, pig butchering. Yeah, the idea is to fatten up the pig before you eat them. And so there can be a long run up time with befriending people and getting them to trust you before ultimate payoffs with scams. And you need to be really aware of how prevalent that is online. So if someone is an instant, internet stranger and you, they reach out to you unsolicited, just teach them to have a little bit of caution you know, just a little bit of skepticism. Um, it doesn't mean you have to stop trusting everyone in your life. It just means that we're going to be smarter about the information that we give to these people and base it on how much we know them about them in real life, not based on an internet persona that we only get a 2D glimpse into. So just teach them about being skeptical of, you know, adding people to their social network that they don't actually know. So. Um, there was this concept, I mean, it, it still is a concept of security through obscurity, mm. right? Which is, well, um, it's a, like, I'm going to share this private page with the world and, but it's like, I got a long string of numbers on it, so it can't be found. So I don't need to password protect it or, um, because it's hard to find. Um, is that still a thing? No. <laughs> No, no, no. The, like, I mean, are we all, are are we no longer needles in a haystack? No, no, we're not. There. So, for example, just look at government tools and remember that these are all tools that were built by contractors who also sell that data to other people. Yeah. They have things like XKeyScore, which actually is a searching system that Google created for them, which is basically like the Google of internal search, where they can search all of these internal databases based on personally identifiable information. So let's say you once had a phone number 16 years ago that was this, you type that in and suddenly you get, oh, okay, here's John's entire portfolio of every phone number he's ever had and every internet alias he's ever had and every IP address. Like there are these collections of, of data that are searchable and becoming even more searchable as we get better with machine learning and you know figuring out how to use this information. So maybe obscurity was useful in an age where we didn't have super powered computers that were doing all of the filtering and tagging for us, but pattern matching in the current digital age where we have incredibly advanced AI powered machines that can see patterns that humans cannot see doesn't exist. So you're no longer a needle in a haystack, you are a needle that is searchable and has everything neatly, you know, yeah. baked into this profile that's that's easily searchable. The way that things like ChatGPT can now um, understand basic questions seems like it poses a new challenge as we're moving forward. And what I mean by that is, you know, even with Google searches, You've got to search in a very particular way to get the thing you want. You've got to use the right words. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's been really interesting and, and, and exciting about ChatGPT and cloud and these large language model technologies is you can kind of talk to it in this imprecise way that we normally talk. Like, hey, wasn't there like a guy that said something <laughs> kind of like this? Like, good example, I had heard... Um, uh, I had heard of this mathematician and I thought his name was like Goat Godel. Like I didn't even know what the name was. I heard it in a, in a talk that was given and he had some theory about um, math, math stuff. So I asked, I couldn't find it in Google. Like Goat Godel, like who's this mathematician? Nothing. I asked ChatGPT, who's the mathematician whose name sort of sounds like this and I just spelled it phonetically and has this theory that's kind of like this. And it was like, oh, you're talking about Kurt Gödel, and he's this, he's got this theorem about the way uh, every system has this sort of arbitrary hole in it. So I can that I leap from that to, oh, so I can just say, find the most racist thing Naomi Brockwell has ever said on the mm. internet. I don't need to know what it was. I don't even know, I don't even have to know if it exists, but I can now kind of search 
in this really human probing Stalin mm-hmm. show me the man I'll show you the crime kind of way, right? Mm-hmm. Are we all headed towards a new disaster with AI on on the privacy front or is it really just one more version of the same stuff we've been talking about already? Yeah, I have a really unconventional take <laughs> on this. So I actually think that AI is going to be really good for privacy. Really? Because people don't realize how easily searchable they are currently. And where it's all been shrouded in mystery and it's not right in front of our faces and with ChatGPT, it's like right there and we're going crazy. We're like, oh no, people are going to know this stuff. It's like, people do know all of this and they use it against you to literally target political ads and videos that seem like they're completely unrelated, but they are literally targeting you because they want you to think in a certain way and hate a certain type of people because they you think that those people are hating you. We are so easily manipulatable, is that a word? Manipulatable. I get um, it. Yeah, and nations are literally manipulating us in this way. It, the internet is just rife with someone's agenda and propaganda and using algorithms and Manufactured buying, consent. Absolutely. People buying your attention. And of course, they're going to buy your attention. It's for sale. And so, and you're yeah, voluntarily giving it, you know, to companies by, by using all these services that allow them to target you. And so we have this system that is so bad for privacy right now. But what AI has done is kind of democratized it and given that power to everyone. Because I don't want a system where power is so unbalanced that only certain people get access to these powerful tools. The thing that's happened in the digital age is companies, like we have become so much more transparent to big companies and to governments, but they have not become more transparent to us. And that asymmetry in power is dangerous. I'm really excited about a world where it becomes democratized and everyone has that power. And my unconventional take in terms of it's gonna be good for privacy is that we now have at our disposal amazing noise generators. So I think data brokers are gonna go extinct. Before, data brokers could literally follow me around the internet, collecting my digital breadcrumbs, hoarding them like digital pack rats, and then selling it to the highest bidder or to whoever, you know, strong arms them and says, give me this data because we're a powerful government and threaten you. That stuff happens right. too. Hey, um, Apple. Yeah. <laughs> nice business you got there. Nice business you got there. I hate something to happen to it. Right. Um, so I think that we're entering a world where, and people are terrified of this world, where we're not going to be able to tell what's real and what's not. But I think that that is going to, like, like for example, let's say that like there's a whole bunch of nude photos of you leaked on the internet, right? I'm sorry, everyone. <laughs> sorry, everyone. In advance. <laughs> and so they're all out there. Mm-hmm. And maybe in the first few years that this happens, They're people like, will be Look scandalized. At this ape. No, just... They'll be like, oh my God, new <laughs> photos of people. Like it's gonna be a crazy few years. Yeah. And after a while, we're gonna be so numb to it because people are just gonna release their own designer nude photos. We're gonna flood the internet with so much misinformation, but that actually is kind of a privacy through obscurity that I think will work because we have super high powered machines that are doing it for us that can actually obfuscate these these patterns. That's an interesting and so, take. Yeah, just imagine generating a profile. Like instead of someone saying, okay, well, I can tell that this is a redhead with green eyes and she's Australian and all this. What if they're like, okay, the data that I'm getting sent out is someone who's just pacing back and forth in like a six foot block. Are they like circling a cell? Are they an inmate somewhere? And they're in this vicinity. It seems like they're coming from there and it seems like they're in their, you know, mid fifties or something. Like we're just going to be able to create hyper realistic data, like streaming data, but also just the images and the videos, like everything. The, the world is about to change. It's going to be crazy. Some of it's going to be for the worse. Some of it's going to be for the better, yeah. but we have to understand the current situation is one where privacy is really disappearing fast and we're voluntarily hanging away because we don't know what's going on and suddenly it's being put right in front of our noses and we're going to start to do things that actually do obfuscate who we are and stop data brokers being able to have this business model where they can sell reliable data about us they're not going to know what's reliable data about us so that i think that model is just going to disappear and we're going to enter this whole new paradigm so that's my unconventional take there again like technology is neutral right it's a double-edged sword it's not negative it's not positive Mm -hmm. i think that we can harness this this technology for good we can harness it to give us back our privacy and i think we need to focus on ways to achieve that instead of thinking of the doom or all of that stuff okay it's really powerful how can we use that to our advantage as well 
maybe Google Gemini's image search was the first uh -huh. effort of this. Like, I'm trying to find George Washington. Oh, I didn't realize he was African American. That's interesting. <laughs> So Google's yeah. way ahead of me on this. Yeah, Google you know, is I'm, I'm very a white inventive. man, so I, I'm totally unfindable on Google Gemini. So. Yeah, so it's fantastic for you. It's really good. I'm already private. It's amazing. Yeah, no, it's like, it's so funny, these different AI models. I'm not because... white, by the way. I'm like light browns in the color. <laughs> Just saying. Like right now, the AI models that we're early stages, and we've just got like a few really big ones that we're paying attention to. We also don't realize that this power currently is democratized and everyone can kind of have their own compute going and their own systems. There are open source systems that are more private. Like mm -hmm. there are all these competing tools out there. So it's not like these AI tools will be able to control the narrative and say, you know, George Washington was absolutely, you know. <laughs> he was a Native American. He was, he was Aztec. This, like whatever, you know, it, we're gonna have all these competing sources for knowledge and that's great. My biggest fear is that we get so doomerish on AI and think, well, this is a technology that's gonna be scary. Let's get licenses in place so only certain people can use it. Suddenly you've put us back to the old system where only certain people have access to these tools and that balance of power is right back to where we had it before. We want democratization of this technology. We want open access so that everyone can get it and not just certain powerfully politically connected people. This has been an amazing conversation. You've covered so much, so much tools. Some of it's been scary. It's scary about privacy. Tech's really great. Embrace it. Ah! But one of the things I'm curious about is as you've spent all this time and energy on privacy and on ways to navigate it and talk to people about it, why do people trust the government at all? And I mean this, I mean this as a serious question because hmm. it's very weird to me that we've got an almost endless supply of privacy invasions that are lied about. You know, Snowden was just one of many. And yet there are a lot of Americans who buy this story that like the same people that have lied to us about virtually everything and are the biggest purveyor of misinformation are going to be the ones to protect us and protect our privacy and stop big tech from doing X, Y, and Z. What is the least mocking case you can make? Have you talked to these people enough to have a sense of, most people are good hearted and not villains. Um, I just assume it's just utter ignorance, but is there some other thing going on that I've missed? Help me, help me empathize with the people who are like, no, Uncle Sam is gonna, is gonna keep me safe and private and, and, be, and make sure I'm seeing the truth, you know, like mm -hmm. the Gulf of Tonkin or something. Like, uh, Help me out here. So I have a few takes on this. I would say generously, most people are just trying to live their lives mm -hmm. and For they sure. probably don't really want government involvement, but if the government hands them a policy on a platter and it's like, this is gonna help all these people vote for that and we'll change the world for the better. And you're it's just to protect trying to- kids, online privacy, everything's good, yeah. fuzzy act. Yeah, exactly. I like Make the name of that. Be so, yeah. for your company, country and protect women and help the poor and make everyone rich. It's like, oh, okay, that sounds great. And so they're just paying their bills and they're trying to pay for their kids to, you know, exist. <laughs> and they're trying to, you know, get their jobs done and then do maintenance on their house. And life is overwhelming. Yes. And politics is gross. And most people just don't want anything to do with that. Yes. Um, but when it's rammed down their throats, they pay attention and then they have to make a decision every few years about things. And so I think that you know, it, it's just people have a lot on their plate. That's my most generous argument um, for all of this. I would say given that people have a lot on their plate, I'm going to go back to that advice that I said before. Be discerning about what you're told. Be skeptical about what you're told. That's not just from strangers. That's from media outlets. That's from us. <laughs> or, yeah, organic movements that suddenly spring up that came out of nowhere. Like, put, put this in, in perspective. If I 
wanted to create a splash. Let's say I did a video and I'm like, oh, how do I get everyone to talk about this? And I want it to go viral and all this. Do I just rely on Google to do it or hope that people like it? No, I'm probably going to write to every blogger I know and say, hey, can you promote this? And probably if I have, uh, you know, contacts at major media outlets, I'll be like, hey, can you write an article? You know, in fact, write articles leading up to this months in advance, you know, prepping people for it so that when this comes along, it's like, oh, the Marketing. big reveal. I would have so many people just trying to, like, support this cause. And I'm someone with zero resources, right? If I were the government, if I were a politician and I had an agenda and there was something I wanted to push, I would start marketing that and every blogger and all like every trending thing on Twitter. Uh, I would just start utilizing all of that. That's the reality we currently live in. Those Twitter trending tags that you see, the things on Facebook that are trending, all of these are artificially created most of the time. It's by our government, it's by other governments. They literally have entire departments now focused on social media where they are, you know, you even have data companies who are aging profiles uh, for years and years and years so that they can be sold to governments and governments will buy them so that they can use that in these departments to like merge, like shift public sentiment, right? Mm -hmm. And this is happening by every, every government in the world. They're using these resources. And so we have to realize that if we're not paying attention to politics, but like every few years suddenly we start getting narratives thrown at us, we need to start being a more skeptical population. And instead of just taking it at face value what these people are telling us, we're going to save the Gay Whales Act with, you know, disabilities or whatever the, the hot topic is, you know, and I'm not, I'm not speaking down to any of the, these things. I'm saying no, that... No, there's a, there's definitely... Well, I'm saying that these people... That's probably they're virtue a program. Yeah, they're, they're virtue signaling by trying to find what Ever, like the most trended topics are that have been curated and then jumping onto the, these bandwagons and you just need to just be doing more research in this world like it's like i think that people are not fundamentally bad i think they do want to make the world a better place um but i think that we need more skepticism uh, about our own government and understand how much propaganda we're being fed it's endless and it is all around us. It's constant. It's this incessant stream of public narrative shifting. And like, there's a reason why when cryptocurrency first came out, the only reports you'd ever read about it were, oh, this is the drug smugglers and the yeah. you know, money launderers. It's all the bad guys. And they just tried that, that smear campaign for years and years and years. And it happens with so many industries. So just before you get on the outrage bandwagon, take a deep breath <laughs> and just think like whose agenda might this be serving? Look into the details a little more. Just take a pause before you jump in. I think that's the, you know, the best thing we could do right now. I ask this of every guest. We call this show Dad Saves America because not because I'm the dad that's going to save America because I'm just one guy. But that I think that we as parents in particular and for the guys out there as dads, um, have this heroic role in shaping the future because we have our kids and we can guide them up to a point. And so how do you think about your role in, in especially as an immigrant, as a, as a, you've chosen to come to America, how do you think about your role in the American story? I want to help make the world a better place. And I saw America as a great place to do that. Um, I think that has great foundation. I think that it's built on this idea of limitations and checks and balances and that equalization of power. And I think that's really important. And so in a world where it seems more and more that the power just keeps being centralized in one direction and with privacy and surveillance, it's all going in one direction and that power imbalance is really getting extreme. Like what I hope to contribute is to teach people that there are ways that they can actually reclaim their power back. There are things that they can do, very actionable steps that literally take back their power and allow them to carve out more freedom in the online world. So I just hope that that message, you know, gets across to people. And if, you know, people are watching this and they're like, well, I'm a dad and I want to protect my family and, you know, I want to make the world better. I'd say start learning about some of these things because they go a really long way to protecting not only privacy, but safety. Um, and that's something that we can all just, you know, really, really jump onto. And I think it is going to make a big difference in the freedom of our future. Naomi, thanks for being on Dad Saves America. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm.